just screwing around with my new scale here just checking my tone arm balance this one rides real light and tracks extremely well a knob fixes infinity loudspeakers this show has been mainly focused on speakers but you got to have something to drive them in my case I like what I have some people would laugh some people would cry but this is what I've got pushing these infinity classics and it all serves a purpose some are very limited at this point I'm not really spending a lot of albums not really turning a lot of cassettes but hey I have cassettes I have a lot of albums if I want to I still have the equipment and I'm going to use it in the first case we are looking at a Kenwood KD 35R belt driven auto return turntable a lot of people have bad I don't know mojo about belt driven turntables I had a Gerard directly out of a radio station that I had for years prior to this one it was actually a direct drive turntable every time I recorded something now this is back in the day of cassettes but every time I recorded something off of it as the songs would fade out I would always hear that hum and I know a lot of people that said do this and do that. I put foam on the on the turntable. I isolated the feet. We had it setting on concrete at one time, and it always always had that home transfer on into the rest of the system. The real scary thing about it was is when you were really driving hard. Now this is back in my teenage and twenties. You would drive hard. The needle from the Gerard would actually pick up the <laughs> sonic sound from the speakers. And it would get a feedback hum and then it would start to multiply the hum coming from the actual motor and they would feed off of each other and I would be in another room and it would be blasting and all of a sudden it just go and then short out and blow up <laughs> so I replaced it Jeez, this is in a probably late 80s mid to late 80s with this Kenwood been extremely happy with it I just uh, replaced the belt on it and Again, I'm still very happy. I think something to do, a lot of people say the plates are too too light. This one's pretty pretty solid. I mean, it's not as heavy as, you know, a floating piece of granite, but at the same time, it actually gets the job done. Maybe I'm missing something, I don't know. I found for what I use it for, as I said, my album collection is limited, and for what I use it for, I am very happy with it. As I said, it's a two-speed turntable. It has a T- 4P cartridge connector. It's also fitted with a V63 phono cartridge and a N63 stylus. So I mean, it's 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 nice. As I said, I can't find any for sale at the moment, and exact replicas. But I mean, turntables of this quality today, they almost give them away. But again, I've had it since it's been brand new, so I'm cool with it. Okay, down to number two here. This is something that gets used almost continuously. It's our Sony SCD CE595 5 disc CD Super Audio CD player. And what's that mean? It means that it plays Super Audio CDs. And they are like, well, for you audiophiles, you know what they're like. My CD player broke. I had a single disc CD player, so you can imagine how old it was and had awesome, awesome sound. I went to Best Buy pretty much picked up one of the best ones they had and it was going to be temporary come to find out they just happened to have a sale on something they probably shouldn't have because it was much better quality than anything they ever usually have I took it home have had it ever since it's probably 15 plus years old it has a uh, time alignment functions for the optimized uh, SACDs dual lasers I mean it can go on and on optical digital output yes it does I mean you have a LED light on the back and it has a fiber cable and it would plug into an LED light on your receiver and that's how it transmit all the sound I actually have mine run off of RCA cables because my receiver doesn't actually do that so it doesn't really change the quality any anyway from what I understand I mean we're not talking about a laser here we're talking about LED lights actually shining through a fiber optic so nobody's really had like you know Oh my god, this is so much better than the other way because it, it's basically kind of 
equals that. It just makes it real easy for connections. One of the things they had a problem with, I found out later on, about two years into their existence, they started having alignment issues and the Super CDs wouldn't play and they'd have this problem and that problem. As I said, I've had mine for about 15 years now. I bought it brand new. Yeah, it, it's never had an issue. Knock on wood, which I would do, but it would bang with a camera right now have nothing bad to say about it. I mean, it plays regular CDs awesome. It plays CDs that, I don't know, my computer has a problem with, and I've been very pleased with it, and as I said, I've had it for 15 years. So, I mean, I've got my money's worth out of it, that's for sure. Today, they run about 100 bucks used, and I saw one that was what they call renewed. Who knows what they talk about doing about renewed. I didn't really look into it too much. That one ran, or those run about around 400 bucks. So, I mean, but there is a big following for these guys. And then, as I said, I don't know, sometimes it's ear, sometimes it's luck. But I've had pretty good luck with some stereo equipment over the years in my choices. Okay, down to number three. All right, number three on the list. This is something that's been around since brand new also. You'll be able to tell in a second here how long I've had it. This is a Sharp RT310 stereo cassette deck with Dolby B noise reduction. It was first sold by Sharp in 1984 with a manufactured suggested retail price of $120 and discontinued three years later in 1987. I've had it since it was brand new off the showroom floor, so uh, we're looking at a number of years. Nice thing about this guy, it's got two heads. It's a mechanical three counter, which most of them are, you know, uh, some of the high points of it. Manual tape type selection and capable of handling normal chrome metal tapes. Spelt driven with a single Caspian transport. Uh, Dolby noise reduction, like we said, reduces hiss on tapes recorded as much as 10 dB at its highest frequencies. You can make live recordings by using the two mics here, or you can actually use the headphones also for direct right into your headphone when you're doing recordings. So you can actually have your mics in and your headphones in. Pretty wild for uh, 19, may have been 86. It was pretty progressive at the time. Today, not so much. I probably have, I don't know, 50, 60 cassette tapes left. It's here until they're gone. They'll probably stick around forever. So, uh, very pleased with it. As I said, I'll, right now I'm in, in the market for some new belts. I just did a turntable and now I want to redo it also. So it's probably been 10 years since I've done that. It's a pain, but you know, something you have to do if you want to keep these old formats alive. Let's go down to the next one. Now this here is our dignified gentleman of the group. It is truly an original piece. We bought this in 1983. Yeah, it's been that long ago. I was 14 at the time. <laughs> And I've had it ever since. I don't know if I've become accustomed to it or it has become accustomed to me. But it's truly my reference. I'll get to that in a second. This here is our Techniques SH8025 7 band equalizer. 7 bands per channel, of course. Done right instead of plastic and what have you. It was all brushed aluminum back in the day. And it really looked nice sitting on top of my realistic STA64B receiver with walnut finish and it having a nice brushed aluminum face also. I've had it that long. Yeah, that was my first receiver I actually worked the whole summer for. The stats on it are actually astronomical even by today's standards. But back to this gem, it's got total harmonic distortion is 0.005%. Control is 12 dB plus or minus in either direction. It has frequency bands of 63, 160, 400, 1K, 2.5K, 6.3K, and 16KHZ. I have found over the years, it is my reference. I mean, I guess audiophiles would say this is my reference. Anything recorded prior to like 1995 has a setting, and everything kind of recorded after 1995 has the setting. I mean, there is a couple exceptions, but the majority of times, it's not like I'm over here remixing albums with it or CDs. It's just, I know, I can just know right away that it's, this has to go up, that has to go down, or that has to go up, and this has to go down. It's been a lifesaver over the years. Unlike a lot of audiophiles, I don't have 
have a specific room just built for my listening. They usually have to function in multiple roles and it's actually adapted everything I've ever had over my lifetime pretty much to the situation from living in a bedroom at home to a living room that was a 12 by 12 to now a full basement which is 26 by 28 so and it's been able to adapt to all those and I get the same sound out of it it's amazing if I am accustomed to the way it sounds in my last house I bring it here and within a minute or so I can have it have the same exact sound it will accommodate everything that's actually surrounding it you know the, the things that are blocking the speakers the things that are on the walls I know audiophiles hate them as I said I've had them since 1983 and I couldn't see life without them now to the last one and last and certainly not least this is our Onkyo TX595 AV receiver one thing we'd like to note we've looked up the specs on these many times and apparently the versions that were made in Asia your Canada Mexico and the United States all have different specs I believe ours was made in the United States instead of the 100 watts per channel at 8 ohms it was actually 115 watts per channel at 8 ohms and oddly enough, the Europeans, it was all the way down to like 80 watts per channel. Now, this is a pretty old receiver on most people's standards. It's probably close to 15 years old, but it does have a lot of awesome features. One, it has a variable independence switch on the back. You can take it from 4 ohms or 8 ohms, and that helps out a whole lot. Now, over the years, I've heard some comments about the receiver doesn't have great reception when it comes to the FM. I happen to live around a big city or actually between two big cities and I've even received reception on occasion now just you know the right settings that was actually a state away so I don't have any complaints there but some people have over the years it's pretty simple I mean the design is laid out everything's you know there's no searching through buttons and looking for different functions it has four speaker outputs. Another thing about it that's really nice is the amp itself is actually a solid state, but everything else is kind of analog. I mean, even when you use the remote, it actually is a motorized volume knob. So you'll just see it turn. And these aren't run off the remote, the balance and the treble and the, and the bass settings, but they also are analog, which is for a digital faced receiver, that's a pretty nice feature for, yeah, you just want to get in between, you know, five and six or whatever it is. Sometimes you just want to be right in between the two of them. And with analog knobs, you actually can do that. This is an interesting feature also. There is no bypass for the tone controls. A lot of people would freak out about that. But instead, a fourth lead actually comes off the pots which is connected to a ground that grounds the center of the pot's resistive element ensuring that the detent is placed at a point that removes the pot amateur from the circuit now of course i just read that you know i if i just said yeah well it goes to you know you put it in neutral and it just it bypasses it you'd be like well, how does it do that well that's exactly how it does that it has tape monitor loops, which actually makes it so I can use an equalizer on top here. That was one of my criteria. Not so many come with that anymore because those audiophile people don't want you to actually have any tone control, including bass and treble. Some of the newest stuff doesn't even have that. I'm thinking sooner or later, it won't even come with a volume knob. You'll just plug it in, it'll play, and then you just unplug it. Uh, I'm not sure why. They just keep taking away controls. But it's the same with the computer world, too. I mean, uh, Windows 95, if you actually look at it, you could almost reprogram the features they would give you. Today, it's hard enough just to open your email. Let's get back to this. So we had 100 watts per channel at 8 ohms. Like I said, this one was rated at 115 because it's where it was built. Who knows? It could have been 100 watts. But at 4 ohms, it's supposedly around 145 watts per channel which is better. Not necessarily anything louder. I mean, it's uh, already rocks my neighbors a bit as it is. It's got 0.08 total harmonic distortion. Apparently dynamic power load supplied by Onkyo indicates that this unit can actually sync a peak current at 13 amps into two ohms. That's, that's pretty impressive. Again, we're not talking about a 
$1,500 receiver here, I actually paid brand new for this thing about 325 bucks. And they actually go a little cheaper than that today. I'm not even going to insult myself by saying how much. I mean, I could go on with lists and lists about this thing. And I, it, just from personal experience, the receiver's a hoss. My speakers, which I'll get to in a second, I used to call them receiver killers. They were forum load speakers and they love to suck up some power. And, but, you know, with four ohms, that power is flowing right through them and on the way back to the receiver and it blown up a lot of stuff. This one, the only time it's ever hit circuit protection is because I've done something. I crossed the wire, screwed up, pushed something when I should have pulled it, whatever. It has good sound. I'm not going to say it's got the greatest sound. My thing is, is I'll let my equalizer clean that up and I seldomly actually move the bass in troubles. I usually just do bypass and just leave them like it is and uh, we'll reset my equalizer here to what I want. I've been very happy with that and you know on, then on rare occasions that my equalizer is where it's at and I really don't want to fool with anything. I just want the bass to hit a little harder. I'll just come over and just tweak the bass a tiny bit and it uh, works out real well. As I said, it's a very simple receiver function wise I and mean, you can just roll right through the functions. It's got multi-room remotes. I mean, it's got a lot of features that I don't even use and this was the cut down version of the home theater unit, which would have actually run quadraphonic speakers and all kinds of stuff. So I just wanted it to be a receiver. I do actually have my TV plugged into it. The only issue is, is it's only going to be as good as what's sent to it. And my TV doesn't send a really good signal to it. A little disappointed about that. You know, I know it can be better because I have an older TV and before I had this new one here and it sounded really good. So... And that's basically my rundown. I did skip my AC Infinity here. That's a fan and you can set it by temperature or you can set it by turn it on, turn it off. And there's other ones. There's the next upgrade up. It's actually digital and it's on a remote. It's all kinds of neat things. I just didn't want, need all that. I have mine plugged into the accessory plugs on the back of the receiver. When I turn it on, I usually have it set down low. If I plan on jamming, I'll just give it a couple clicks, push it up. But what it does is there's actually fans in the bottom of this unit and they suck the air out of the receiver and air comes in through the back of this and comes through it. And then it blows it out these vents right here and you can stand here and you can feel the warm air actually blow off of it. We'll see how it uh, works out over time but for now it's uh, definitely something that's staying in the stack because it takes a receiver that is getting a lot of ohm feedback or a lot of power feedback because of these low ohm speakers and keeps it very cool so and that's the game I and mean, I've had other homemade units and they've kind of sucked appearance wise I mean they actually worked real well but, I mean you'd look at them and just be like yeah just keep the lights off this thing has a pretty appearance they come in different features you can actually get them to suck out of the bottom out of the top you can actually get them to blow out of the top and suck out of the bottom so it just actually blows it straight up say if it's sitting on the table or something I got a home theater unit underneath your TV. It gets a little hot, you know. There's multiple selections. Not endorsing AC Finity. It's just something I found that was pretty cool recently. I've only had it for a couple months, so. All right, let's move on to something else. All right, what's behind all this is these guys. I have two sets of Infinity RS. 3A's. They're almost four foot tall, about 18 inches wide, and almost nine inches deep. No ports, nothing like that. Two tens, a polydome mid range, and an Emmett tweeter. Now, these were built between, say, 84 and 86. I acquired my first set around 1988. A friend of mine had them. I used to listen to them all the time, thought they were awesome. He thought they were awesome until he found a set that was more expensive. Now, I didn't think they necessarily sounded any better. And actually, I kind of think they sounded a little worse, to be honest. But they were more expensive, and he had to have them. So I was more than willing to take them off his hands. They originally went for anywhere between the $1,800 and $2,000. I paid $800 for them at the time in 1988. That's 800 real dollars there, baby. About 10 years later, maybe 12 years later, online, went on this new site called Craigslist and did a search for the whole country. And just out of a whim, I put in Infinity RS3As and bam, up another set came. I was just like shocked. So 
I call the guy and he's like, yeah, my brother went to jail and he needs money for bail and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, look, I'm like three states over. This is before, you know, big time shipping and all that stuff. And um, he said, I'll get him to you. No problem. I'll take him to work and have him shipped. And they had him shipped to my company, which I worked for at the time. Well, actually, I didn't own the place, but, and they came in on a big yellow truck. I mean, I've had them ever since and they were in beautiful shape. Being that I've had these since 1988 is one of the reasons why a lot of my stereo systems kind of stayed the same. It was kind of like, yeah, I like this and it stayed that way. As you saw in past episodes of the show, I've done a lot of work to refurbish them. Just recently, I've done some in the past and this time I decided I was going to sit down and I was going to go through all of them and make them as new as possible, especially since the Emmett diaphragms are actually available. That brought me up to something else. Now the RS3As had awesome sound and I had a real hard time complaining about them until I got my second set and then I would turn one set off and I was just shocked on the difference. I mean the fullness of the second set really added a lot to the whole deal. And then I got this idea after the diaphragms became available. I had a box full of these guys and I went ahead and bought some of the diaphragms and I built this box for them and used an Infinity RSA crossover. And I found that I've actually, I've pulled all my high tones back equally across the board. This has a sound that is fuller and yet is quieter. It's, that's the only way I can really explain it. I've only had it for a couple weeks and I'm telling you, I've got two of these guys, one on top of each one, and it really fills out the sound of the RS3As because you already have two 10 inch subwoofers per speaker, you know, and only one mid range. And I tend to pull mid ranges back anyway. I think a lot of these manufacturers love to push the 1K and then that just, uh, I don't know why it irritates me. I think it just distorts everything around it. So I tend to pull the 1K back and that means the mid range is gonna drop out and these Emmets, you don't really want to push them hard, especially for all these years. You know, it was a 25 year period. You couldn't actually get diaphragms for them. And if you want to go nail some high tones, man, you could really be burning up some money because you'd have to actually go out and buy Emmett speakers on eBay and such like that and actually take them apart and use the diaphragms at them or use the whole speakers and throw your, your speakers away. So that's why I had an assortment. I actually had 11, one or two of them that were really kind of out of shape and didn't match. So I've got eight in the new tops here. It really just fills out the sound. It is amazing on what it does. It's just not louder. It's not more high tones. It's just there entirely. But that's my little creation. My little, and I'm waiting on my infinity badge now. I actually have one on the other one as we speak, but still in the mail. And then of course, I still have these Infinity RSAs. They sat in the closet for 20 plus years. And when I got them, they were like semi-destroyed. And during the episodes, we refinished them and redid the fronts and new tweeters and new foam for the Wolfers. And I just haven't got a speaker selector that I would actually use so I can actually hook these up. Now the little guys are actually daisy chained off of one of the RS3As or off of two of them actually and being that they only pull about five watts i wasn't so worried about it actually diminishing the other speaker but with this one they they're actually set up to pull some serious wattage right now and i don't have a way to daisy chain those in and think that it's actually going to be able to keep my ohms at a serious level that it's not going to fry my receiver so as i said my receiver is a hoss but you know you put a locomotive on top of a hoss so you got a dead hoss so we're going to try to avoid that but that's what I have and uh, we're going to incorporate them in here eventually if not a whole separate system someplace else because they're pretty cool and they sound really nice but that's what we have and uh, I know it's not like the most audiophile thing but you definitely could go look around on eBay and such and find something very comparable and I bet you for a couple hundred bucks you could besides the infinity still still pay a few dollars for those but most of my equipment you can be found for pennies on the dollar and it still sounds so awesome if you can find it where it hasn't been beat to death already so thanks again all right let's move on to something else